he know was what you're playing say. his yeah. harp yeah. <laughs> before Saul, and demons would leave Saul, and right. Saul would be in his right mind. Yep. When I heard that, I said, Lord, that that was that was an old covenant experience. We got a better covenant on this yes. end because of you. Now I want I want we you got to the Holy sing Ghost. me. Yes, I want these songs. I want. Wow. I mean, what's King David been doing in heaven all these years? Wow. He ain't sitting on his thumbs. He's creating music. When you were six years old, you're in your late sixties now. So when you were six years old, which would put us back about 1960, you played with Bill Monroe. That is very yeah. hard to comprehend. That. I know. My dad bought me a mandolin when I was five. And so I learned. You now, know, why did he do that? Um, I had been singing in church with him and mom since I was like three years old. And this uh, is in they, old Kentucky. Mm -hmm, in, in Kentucky. Uh, and we would sing songs together at home. And then when we go to church, uh, uh, we'd get up and and they would set me literally set me on the pulpit and I would sing harmony uh, with mom and dad. They would set you on the pulpit. Yeah. See, up here we'd say, uh, put you up on the pulpit, but down there they would set you on the pulpit. That sounds better. That sounds yeah. more American. Yeah. But you, you, the reason I'm saying this is you obviously at that time already had a gift for harmonizing. You could hear uh, yeah. and sing, and so they knew that they needed to encourage us. So your dad at age five gets you a mandolin mm -hmm. and already at age six, Bill Monroe is uh, taking notice of you. Well, we, uh, mom and dad and I uh, would play at church, like I said, and then, then dad and I would go to this little local grocery store there in Blaine, Kentucky, and uh, they would set me up on the pop case, you know, that had... That, so it wasn't a pulpit, it was the pop the case. pop case, that, that's the marketplace version. Right. Yeah, so I was getting, uh, I was getting my teeth uh, ready for the marketplace back then. All right, so listen, you've won 15 Grammy Awards. Um, you've gotten every other kind of award. You've worked with practically everyone. And you're, you're a man of, of deep faith. I want to I want to talk about that because that's kind of how we met. Mm -hmm. But I want to keep going on your career here. So you're a you're a young man, very young man, 16 years old, 17 years old, playing with another huge legend, Ralph yeah. Stanley, the famous Stanley Brothers. How wow. did that? Yes. How did that go? How many years were you playing with Ralph Stanley? Well, my my mom and dad, we had gone to see. The Stanley Brothers, uh, right at, the next year after I had played with Bill Monroe, and so we kind of had met Ralph and Carter, and the, Carter and they let me get up and sing with them, you know, or do do a song with them, and um, so anyway, we kind of knew each other, and so Keith Whitley and I met. Keith was a great, uh, ended up being a, a really great, uh, short-lived, unfortunately, uh, country music artist himself and just has recently uh, this past year gotten uh, inducted into the country music hall of fame but he he and i were friends we like 17 days apart in our in our age uh we met my, me and my dad was playing this little place and we met uh keith and his brother they they were playing as well and and uh so I invited Keith over to my house the next weekend. And from that weekend on, you know, we just knew each other, just played music with each, each other almost every weekend. You know, we'd be out of school and playing together. And, and um, so we heard that Ralph Stanley had just hired a, a new lead singer that sounded just like his brother Carter that had passed away a few years before that. So we wanted to go see him. So, well, it was a little beer joint in West Virginia, right across the river from Louisa, Kentucky, where we where I went to high school. So dad took us over there. He always had us prepared, you know, just in case somebody asked us to get up and sing. Well, Ralph had made a phone call uh, that his bus had a flat tire and they were going to be late about 35, 40 minutes. So this club owner, beer but in the joint musician owner, world, that's on time. Oh yeah, but and he's uh, such. He was such a good man that he said, "Well, we don't want thirty-five minutes of dead air." So. Right. Yeah. You know, the natives were getting a little restless in that little beer joint, and so they come up to the table, and I don't know how they knew that that we played. You know, because I'd never been in there before, and we'd never played there. Uh, but they asked us if we, brought, you know, could get up and sing a few songs. You know, and so. 
here again, dad, you know, we go to the car and get the instruments, get up on stage and we start playing and singing. And Ralph comes walking in, you know, on the band. I see him going to the dressing room with her, you know, with their instruments and everything. Well, Ralph doesn't go in the dressing room. He sits down on a bar stool and just eats up what he's seeing. You know, he's seeing these young kids, you know, 16 years old singing Stanley Brothers songs, because that's really the only songs we knew. Right, we were singing right, his songs, right. you know, and I could see him in the in my right eye over there. And I was like, I don't and I was singing his part, you know, and it was so embarrassing, you know. Uh, but anyway, we met, we met that night, you know, and uh, from then on, uh, you know, we would try to play with Ralph whenever we were out of school. If they were close enough, we'd drive and go and. Then finally, when we got out of high school, he hired us full time. And uh, it was a great place for me to grow. You know, Ralph's music is very mountain, very old time. And at a time when a, a lot of musicians would be wanting to to play the newest, greatest, you know, most cutting edge bluegrass, I really wanted to insert myself in in the in the dirt, in the in the ground, in, in the the hills and the hollers. I, I really wanted to know more, even though I was raised in that. There was something about the way he sang, you know, and the Stanley Brothers sang that always just touched me right in my spirit. You know, I just knew uh, that they were singing truth. They were singing songs about heartache. They were singing songs about breakup. They were singing about real life. And you always, for whatever reason. Um, you love those American, those old roots, which yeah. are older than America, of yeah. course. Well, you know, that scripture of honoring your fathers, you know, so that your days and mothers, so that your days go well with you and you'll prosper in the land. You know, that always rang true to me in my heart. Uh, I just knew that if I honored and, and I don't think it means your particular father or mother. I think it's fathers or mothers in the faith. I think it's fathers and mothers that pour into you musically. Uh, it's just honoring people that's that's above you and 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 has lived longer than you have, you know. And uh, there's something that you can get from them that will be beneficial in your life. That's the way I was raised, and um, so. I, I just I wanted to keep keep the roots of of that music alive. Yet I I added drums, I added steel guitar, I added piano, because I'd been with Amy Lou Harris for the last couple of years, and I saw that that was now that was and that's in the seventies. Uh huh. So how did you connect 70s. with with Amy Lou Harris? Well, I met her in Washington D.C. when I was working in a band called The Country Gentleman. I was living in Manassas, working for Vepco. Uh, Vir Virginia Electric and Power Company, and I worked there just to make uh, a rent and, and a car payment for uh, uh, about six months. I got a raise, and then I got a job, and I said, see y'all later. I got and a real So, so you're like, what, 21 years old at this mm -hmm. point? Yeah. You're an old man of 21 you're by right. now. Yeah. So, I had to make a living. So uh, Emmy Lou Harris realizes that she could use um, – an instrumentalist such as yourself in her band. Yeah, and someone uh, that knew the old stuff. Uh, I met her uh, one night. There was a guy in D.C. It was, he was, uh, was a doctor. His name was uh, John John Starling, and he he worked at the Army Hospital there and loved old time music. Worked with the, the Seldom Scene group there, and uh, so he would invite people like you know whoever was was playing the cellar door or whatever big club there in, in Georgetown, he would invite people to come to his house and have a pick in or a singing, you know. And so he invited me to come over It said Linda Ronstadt was going to be there, uh, you know, and uh, that was in the 70s. She, and, she uh, was about as hot as as uh, any performer could be at that time. I mean, yeah. Linda Ronstadt was yeah. was huge. And, uh, Linda, and, and also and, kind of connecting the pop and the, the, the and roots. roots. Right. And Emmy Lou knew Linda very well, but I did, I'd never met Emmy Lou. She came in and just kind of squatted down on her knees in the floor, pulled out a, an old, you know, Gibson guitar and started singing. And it was like, oh my God, this angel just walked in, you know, with this voice. And uh, so me and her and Linda was singing harmony and stuff together on these songs. I knew so many old songs and they, they wanted me to teach it to them, you know, and, and here 
I was carrying the Stanley Brothers. I was carrying Bill Monroe. I was carrying that old uh, Leuven Brothers, uh, even, sound and in my heart. And they wanted to know it. I want to talk to you a little about your faith. Mm -hmm. And you grew up, obviously, you said your, your father uh, W would set you up on the pulpit mm -hmm. when you were like five. So you grew up very much in the church. Mm -hmm. I did. Um, foot washing Baptist, you know, is what we were, free will Baptist. And um, it was just a beautiful thing to grow up like that, you know. And, and uh, you know, preacher would get up and say, has anybody got a word or a testimony? Well, here, the testimonies would start, you know. So wait, the Baptists would think that somebody could get a word? That sounds more Pentecostal. Well, it wasn't like a word of prophecy. It was like you got a word to, to say or you have something to uh -huh, say or uh -huh. give, your, give your testimony. Okay. Like. And so these precious old women of the faith would get up and talk about their son coming to Jesus, you know, and uh, that they'd prayed for him for years, an alcoholic, and God has delivered him and stuff like that, you know, and... and uh, just beautiful, beautiful things, you know. And uh, when 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 they prayed, they all prayed together. And boy, you talk about something that will run the chills up your back is to hear, you know, seventy five people in a little small wooden church, you know, just praying to God, just just going after it, you know. Some of the, of the old men up at the altar just just going after it, you know, uh, with the Lord and and praying. You know, all at the same time, you know, and uh, that's the way I grew up. So you grew up right in the middle of this. But, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, I, I grew up singing in the church, but then they go on to have kind of a secular career that's extra secular. You know, they really move away from those roots. It doesn't sound like you ever did. No, I, you know, I've had experiences with the Lord where, um, you know, Sharon and I both, you know, when we got married, you know, we both had come from divorced uh, background. She didn't have any kids. I did. I had two two older uh, children, but we dedicated our lives to the Lord from that moment on when we when we got married. And uh, uh, I had recommitted my faith, you know, to to, to Jesus. And uh, I, I wasn't baptized when I went to the altar when I was thirteen years old. I wasn't baptized after that. And uh, not that baptism Wait a minute, saves what, uh, you. Go go back. You yeah. when you went to the altar at thirteen. So you at, at age thirteen, yeah. you made a profession of faith. But I mean, I, I get the impression you believed before that, but that oh, some, yeah. for some reason at age 13. Well, I, I knew that I wasn't saved. I couldn't get to heaven just because of my mom and dad's goodness. You know, God has no grandchildren in heaven. <laughs> that's all, all his right, kids, that's right. you know. And so we all come uh, and, and have our own relationship with Jesus. And I, I knew I, I needed that, you know, and I knew that uh, I needed my sins to be forgiven, you know. And um, but, you know, we got baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know, a few years after uh, after we got married. Uh, we knew that there was more. We knew that it was more than just uh, just a Baptist, uh, you know, coming to faith that that there was a, you know, there was, you know, John the Baptist talked about Jesus would uh, baptize you with water and fire, you know, and uh, and so we always always wondered what that fire was, you know, and that we wanted, we wanted, you know, the the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, and... Uh, I mean, a lot of people listening don't even know what that is. And I, you know, I came to faith uh, around my 25th birthday, and I pretty quickly got the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, so to me, I, I, I was uh, speaking in tongues and believing in the yeah. baptism of the Holy Spirit and all of that stuff yeah. immediately. But there are a lot of people that they think, well, that's a little odd, or that's maybe extra credit Christianity. I'm not into that stuff. Well, it's uh, I say it's the full package, but you know, Jesus is always the full package. He brings everything with him. You know, he brings the bread and the wine when he comes to dinner. You know, in Revelation. You know, not only uh, uh, is he the wine, you know, and, and is he the bread of life, but he brings it with you with him when you when he comes in to have dinner. You know, to said. Uh, if you'll open the door to me, I'll, I'll come in and sup, you know. And uh, so he's he's all of that, you know, and we need all of him. You know, we don't just need uh, I don't want to I don't want to have anything hidden from the Lord because you can't you can't hide anything from the Lord. And uh, so, you know, I just uh, I really believe in communion, you know, with the Lord every day, you know, 
And uh, there's just something about it, you know, uh, that's very, very special, that time just to sit and have have time with the Lord, you know, and just just have communion with Him, you know. Now, Ricky, we're we're talking before the thing, the joy um, to me of, of, of talking to you because it just brings back when I think of how much music has blessed me to my bones mm-hmm. over the years, and you know, various genres. I was talking to you about Super Tramp the oh, other yeah. day, and yeah. I, you know, there's so many different kinds of music that God uses a lot of secular music, but the beauty of it is from him. It's from his throne, whether people yeah. realize it or not. And we were, we were talking earlier about the song that Chris Christopherson wrote, Why Me Lord, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And I thought this is the most beautiful song I've ever heard. And then George Jones sings it. And I thought, yeah, I didn't think it could be kicked up a notch or, yeah. or whatever, but you know, I don't know that this side of glory, we will ever figure out what it is about music that does something. But to me, it's, it's, there is no question that we're made in God's image because yes. when we make music, there is just something ineffable to use a big word about beautiful. it. There's something beautiful about it. So I don't know. I thought since you're here and you brought your instrument, maybe um, you could play something or we could, uh, yeah, we could talk about different songs. God is, is a creative being and he made us to be creative, you know, Amen. Uh, everyone has the abilities to create, you know. And um, so I hear these things. I hear these instrumentals in my head. And uh, right before uh, Bob Jones always used to say, uh, in that place I go of in, of a morning where I go in, that place I go into of a morning. Of a morning. Yeah. And uh, that right before I woke up, I heard this song a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. Now, is, is that, that a song precious? that came to you ori- originally, that it just kind of drops into your head yep. from someplace? Yep. That's how I get most of the instrumentals that I do. I don't just sit around. I and consider that start. cheating. I just want you to know, folks, yeah. that's cheating. Yeah. You didn't, I mean, seriously, what an amazing thing. What a gift. What an absolute you know, gift that you I, just, yeah. it just comes to you. Because you've, yeah. you know, you hear this, that Mozart and others that just, that yeah. they hear melodies or Beethoven and, that happens to you. Yeah. When I got a hold of that verse where King David was singing, Near my God to thee. No, he wasn't singing. I know, stop it. But, <laughs> but you, I he know what you're going to say. playing his yes. harp yeah. <laughs> before Saul, and demons would leave Saul, and right. Saul would be in his right mind. Yep. When I heard that, I said, Lord, that, that, was, that was an old covenant experience. We got a better covenant on this yes. end. Because of you, now I want I want we got you to the Holy send Ghost. me. Yes, I want these songs. I want. Wow. So, I mean, what's King David been doing in heaven all these years? Wow. He ain't sitting on his thumbs. He's creating music, and I think those that take it by force, those that take that's part of the kingdom is on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, these things are in heaven. Why can't we have them here so we can bless people that don't know the Lord? 